I started a recording here because uh, last time we did this, I forgot to turn it on until we were getting into it. So I'm just going to start it now and then we can always hack off the first uh, five, ten minutes of it when we post it. Okay. So it should be good. Sounds good.
we will be starting a webinar in approximately two minutes. Well, hello everyone and welcome to the Parsons Technical Webinar Series presentation for May. We are glad to have you with us today. I'm your host, Scott Hartzell, and I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, today's presentation is by Ed Heisey with Parsons, who will discuss sulfate enhanced bioremediation of fuel contamination at the former Galena Forward Operating Location in Galena, Alaska. Ed is joined today by Bruce Henry and Brian Blicker, who provided additional support to the project. During the presentation, we will be muting all phone lines to reduce background noise. If you have questions during the presentation, you can submit them using the chat feature here in MS Teams, and we will take those at the end of the presentation. I'd also like to mention that the webinar has been approved for PDH hours. So if you have a need for continuing education credits, the sign-in sheet has been posted in the chat section of the presentation, or you can always just send me a note at scott.hartsall at parsons.com, and we will get you the sign-in sheet and process a certificate for your PDH hour. And now a little bit about our presenter. Ed Heisey has been with Parsons for over 18 years, and he is a member of the Parsons Fellows Program. He brings to us uh, over 38 years of experience with Department of Defense site remediation. Ed serves as the technical director of the Galena site projects, and he is supported by Bruce Henry, who is the project manager for the Galena projects, and Brian Blicker, the principal engineer for the site. And now I'd like to turn things over to Ed for a core value moment and our presentation. Thank you, Scott. Um, hello everyone. Um, the core value I'd like to talk about today is safety. Um, we just recently um, deployed our first field team of the season up to Galena. And whenever you're deploying to a field location, it's good to uh, remind yourself of the local hazards. Um, the has some of the hazards at Galena are the four-legged variety, as as we've got pictured here. In particular, the fellow down there at the bottom right. Um, we we have operated uh, a land farm at Galena, and it happens to be next door to the Galena Village landfill, and the bears like to hang out there. So uh, we need to be aware and make sure that, that we're 
uh, avoiding uh, the, the local wildlife. Not all of the wildlife is as photogenic as the bears and the moose, though. I mean, we also have the six-legged variety. At bottom left, uh, you can see a wasp nest that we, we ran into when we were clearing some brush. Um, the team was able to uh, rig up some makeshift PPE using Tyvek so that they could remove that without getting stung and continue with their work. Um, the blurry picture up on the on the top left is uh, um, someone who's working uh, out on the runway at night when the runway shut down and uh, the bugs are pretty bad there, and I don't know if you can see it, but he's he's wearing uh, mosquito netting and plenty of DEET to, to keep off the bugs. So uh, as we're moving out to, into field season, be aware of local hazards and make sure you're using appropriate PPE. Um, what I'd like to talk about today, um, first the uh, first couple of slides uh, uh, tell you a little bit about Galena and, and the sites where we're employing uh, sulfate enhanced bioremediation. A good part of my presentation is on the remedial design, why we chose sulfate uh, enhanced bioremediation and, and how we design the systems. I uh, do have uh, some information on installing and monitoring uh, the the uh, remedial systems as well as the first three years of performance data and then conclude with uh, where we think we go from there. The uh, satellite photo to the right there shows the former Galena forward operating location on the north bank of the Yukon River carved out of the Alaska wilderness. And as you can see, it's mostly runway and the uh, uh, administrative area uh, is this triangular shaped area up to uh, the northwest and these buildings down on the bank of the river are actually private residences. So uh, Galena is a, a village um, in the Alaskan interior on the Yukon River as we saw in the previous slide. Um, since the 40s, there was uh, an Air Force uh, runway there. Uh, most recently, it was a forward operating location where uh, the Air Force would send up uh, interceptor aircraft to, to park out on the runway so that they could go and intercept uh, Soviet aircraft that were coming across uh, the border. Um, the base actually is closed. Um, and the property is transferred. It closed in 2008, but the Air Force is still responsible for cleanup of contaminated sites there, and, and, and the Air Force is who Parsons was working for at this site. Um, we have been working on cleaning up 32 sites at the location since 2013. As I said, the, the base has been transferred. Uh, the administrative buildings are mostly now home to the Galena Interior Learning Academy, which is a high school for students from the very the most remote uh, Alaska villages, the ones that are too small to have a high school of their own. So it's a boarding school, students living there nine months of the year. And of course, the airport is active. Um, I can't stress enough how remote this site is. Um, there are no road or rail access. It's only accessible by aircraft and by barge, and then by barge only a few months of the year. Uh, the village is about 400 permanent residents. There's no hotels, rental car agencies, restaurants. Uh, lo local support is very limited. And perhaps most importantly, uh, it's not connected to an outside electrical grid. Um, all electrical power is generated on site from fuel that's barged in each summer. The, talk a little bit about the aquifer and groundwater. Um, the aquifer consists of river deposits. The general profile that we get is the first five feet or so are is fill material that was brought in when they built the base. Uh, the next 10 feet 
from about five foot to 15 feet below ground surface or Uh, Ed, I think we lost your audio. We'll have Ed back in here in just a minute. Hello, can you? Yeah, <clears throat> we got you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. My phone died on me. Um, sorry for the delay. Anyway, um, as I was saying, the uh, five to 15 foot below ground surface is fine material. We call that the silt layer. And below that, the, the material becomes increasingly coarse and very permeable. Um, we've gone down as far as 200 feet. Um, groundwater uh, flows in that permeable zone. Um, the net flow is towards the river, and that's the direction groundwater flows for most of the year. However, in the spring, when the ice breaks up on the Yukon, the Yukon floods and the river reverses direction. And that's what we see in the hydrograph to the right. Uh, this is a, an observation well. The red line is the ground surface, and the blue line is the uh, groundwater elevation in the well. And you can see usually around May, uh, groundwater uh, uh, level rises very abruptly for uh, four to six weeks, and then for most of the rest of the year, gradually declines as the water flows towards the towards the river. And so that gives us a 20 to 25 foot um, groundwater table fluctuation, which gives us quite the smear zone for fuel contamination. And we do have, uh, with the cold weather in the Alaskan interior, quite a short fuel season, usually uh, April to September. Most of the contamination sites at Galena are uh, results of fuel releases. Um, either from pipelines or from tanks. Uh, there are different types of fuels that were used up there. The most common of them is Arctic diesel, which is diesel which has got some gasoline blended in with it. The site I'll be talking about is actually a JP4 site. And uh, the pattern that we see is that uh, we have a very large smear zone and we have residual napple in that smear zone that, that runs from the highest elevation of groundwater down to its lowest elevation. And so in the picture to the right, we've got the ground surface here. Uh, the top blue dashed line is the highest 
elevation of ground of the groundwater table and then down at 115 feet above mean sea level is the lowest elevation of groundwater um, table and then the bold blue line is the extent of residual napple uh, at at this particular site sto9 and the pattern that we see is we see a broader area up near the top the, the, the highest elevation of groundwater table and what we call the silt layer where capillary action sucks the, the fuel into a, a, a large area. And then we see a, also see a spreading at the bottom extent of the water table and a little bit narrower in between. And we call, call the spreading uh, at, the, at the more shallow elevation, um, the upper pancake and the spreading at the lower uh, at the bottom of the water table, um, the lower pancake. And the other thing I wanted to point out on this slide is that is this this area between the water table fluctuation is unsaturated for different times during the year. The higher you go, of course, is unsaturated more often up here towards the top, where you know we're unsaturated 11 to 12 months of the year down towards the middle, about six months of the year, down towards the, the lowest groundwater uh, table elevation. Uh, you know, we're lucky if we're, we're uh, unsaturated for one or two months of the year. So given that uh, characteristics of our, of our source area, we, we came up with a general approach that we wanted to use at Galena for fuel sites. And, and I like to think of it as a three-layer cake. Uh, for the upper pancake, um, the, the um, residual saturation that's in the, the silt layer, if we could, we would excavate it, take it off to land farming. If, if it was too near infrastructure where we couldn't excavate it, uh, we used a, a bioventing approach with vents completed completely within that silt layer to try to force air in there when the water tape is high. We also use bioventing in this narrower area uh, in the middle of the variably saturated zone. And then down in the lower pancake that is saturated for most of the year, uh, that's where we employed sulfate enhanced bioremediation. And then for the down gradient plume, we use monitored natural attenuation. Now for the site that I'm going to show you, um, there were a couple of additional constraints. One is it was GP4 instead of Arctic diesel, so a lot of volatiles. The silt layer was very thin here, so we couldn't complete vents completely within the silt layer and we couldn't excavate uh, due to infrastructure. And so what we did was we actually had a two layer cake approach where in the green shaded area, we used soil vapor extraction and sulfate enhanced bioremediation in its yellow shaded area. And uh, for the bulk of the rest of the presentation, I'll just be talking about the sulfate enhanced bioremediation. The next couple of slides, I'd like to talk about um, our design. And, uh, you know, before I get into the design, the decision process of, of why we chose sulfate enhanced bioremediation. Parsons has been supporting uh, the Air Force in um, innovative technology for, for well over 25 years. Some of the work we did in the 90s was to help them make the case for natural attenuation of, uh, of fuels. And we did a study for them that was published in 1999 where where Parsons went in and sampled uh, many fuel sites across uh, the, the CONUS looking for evidence of natural attenuation. And one of the things that we saw was that uh, the bulk of natural attenuation uh, occurs uh, through anaerobic processes and that uh, sulfate can be a major contributor for that anaerobic biodegradation of fuel contamination. And if the uh, the background levels of sulfate uh, are significant, like over 200 milligrams per liter, the contribution of sulfate enhanced uh, or sulfate uh, uh, degradation 
is is quite significant, uh, up to three quarters of, of the total um, amount of fuel that's biodegraded is is biodegraded through sulfate reduction. However, if the concentrations of sulfate are are not as high, uh, the contribution of sulfate reduction is is considerably lower. Um, Glenn Ulrich of um, Parsons uh, recognized this and recognized that there was an opportunity here uh, to uh, use to, to augment natural attenuation by adding sulfate and enhanced biodegradation of residual fuel saturation. And he applied for and, and was awarded a patent for that process, um, the NAPLOA patent, uh, whereby nutrients, specifically sulfate, can be added either in dissolved phase or as slow release minerals uh, to augment anaerobic biodegradation of LNAP. We looked at the sites at Galena to see if they would be appropriate for uh, sulfate enhanced bioremediation, and we thought that they were. Um, the background levels of sulfate at Galena are modest, somewhere between 25 and 40 milligrams per liter. But if you look in the various source areas and flume, fuel plumes, you'll see that sulfate is uh, depleted and methane is present, indicating methanogenic um, um, conditions and an opportunity that if we added sulfate, we could, we could increase the amount of sulfate degradation. Also, uh, as you see at many of these sites, we had high concentrations of iron, and we also viewed that in a positive light. So because uh, sulfate is reduced to sulfide, uh, the sulfides can then combine with the iron and precip precipitate as iron sulfides. The technology that the Alaska Department of Environmental Conservation was most familiar with for, for dealing with uh, fuel contamination was air sparging. And so we needed to look at air sparging as, as, uh, as an alternative and, and decide whether or not air sparging or sulfate was, was a better way to go. Pound for pound, um, oxygen is a more efficient electron acceptor than is sulfate. But um, the solubility of oxygen by dissolving air into water is limited, whereas uh, by dissolving a mineral like gypsum, you can achieve much higher concentrations uh, of, of sulfate than, than you can of oxygen. And so this was you know, in line with what we saw with the AFSI study, whereas if there's large amounts of sulfate present, you get a lot of sulfate uh, reduction uh, sulfate biodegradation. There are other um, unique factors at Galena that we thought uh, were, were positive for sulfate enhanced bioremediation. For one thing, the groundwater table, as I said, fluctuates uh, 20, 25 feet. If you're doing air sparging, you've got to overcome that back pressure. Um, and uh, if we were going to do air sparging, it could only be done during the months of the year when the water table was low if we were going to reach those uh, uh, residual saturation in the lower pancake, which meant that we could only operate the system for about half of the time. Whereas by injecting gypsum uh, and providing sulfate, we'd have um, biodegradation going on 100% of the time. Air sparging also takes quite a bit of infrastructure uh, whereas uh, the sulfate enhanced bioremediation, we could inject uh, gypsum using direct push, so no permanent infrastructure. Um, and then probably uh, another very important point is uh, the energy requirements. Um, the, we only needed to do the sulfate amendments for sulfate enhanced bioremediation, but air sparging was going to take electrical energy to, to run the blowers and uh, in order to get that energy, they were going to have to import more fuel, uh, which is how the contamination got there in the first place. And the electricity costs in Galena are approximately five times in the lower 48. And so 
for those reasons, we felt that uh, sulfate enhanced bioremediation was a good good alternative to air sparging at Galena. So as we moved on to the design phase, um, the, the concept was to emplace agricultural gypsum, gypsum dihydrite uh, in the lower pancake uh, that would dissolve over time and provide sulfate to that uh, residual saturation sample source area in the lower pancake. And the idea was inspired by a permeable reactor barrier concept uh, that we would emplace gypsum in injection zones near the upgrading end of the source area and groundwater would flow through these injection zones, dissolve the gypsum and carry the sulfate down through the NAPL source areas. Um, design considerations were, uh, first of all, um, you know, how, how wide do these injection zones need to be? Um, and this was based primarily on um, how long we wanted the sulfate to last. We, we used a design criteria of five years. And so the thickness of the injection zone uh, was calculated by the design time, five years, times the groundwater flux, times the solubility of gypsum, divided by uh, the porosity in the ground, in the gypsum concentration in the injected slurry. So how, how fast was groundwater dissolving the, the gypsum away? Uh, the other consideration we had was, you know, uh, how many of these injection zones do we need? And so we, we looked at uh, how our estimated uh, utilization rate for sulfate, which we got from some literature values of uh, sulfate a biodegradation of fuel in a cold weather site in Canada in the groundwater velocity. And we figured that uh, the, the gypsum, the, the sulfate after it dissolved from the injection zone would be carried about 110 feet down gradient before it was utilized. The final consideration in the design was that we didn't want to clog up the pore spaces and have groundwater flowing around and not through our injection zones. Uh, Bruce had done some injections involving sl uh, gypsum uh, for a study that he did in Anchorage uh, a couple of years earlier, and it was a similar type of aquifer, and he was pretty confident we could get 7.7% solids into the uh, into the aquifer. Later on, we figured we, we learned that uh, the aquifer at Galena was considerably more permeable than we thought, and we we upped this to 10% solids. And we decided that we wouldn't inject this as a monolithic zone, but rather as injection dispersed injection points. So that if we did clog the pore spaces, we still had uh, places for the water to go in and around the in, in injection points and, and maximize surface area and contact and, dis, and therefore dissolution of the gypsum. So our, uh, injection, our, our, our design looks something like this, where we would have injection points and we space these injection points out at uh, uh, on 10 foot centers and we were going to inject a slurry of gypsum in water such that we would displace um, the, the, the water in the pore spaces out uh, three feet from the injection point. And we'd have rows of these injection points. And whereas uh, our design thickness of the wall was 11 feet to get five years worth of, of sulfate dissolving, we did have 11 or 12 feet, but it was spaced out over a wider area in these different injection points. So this is a map of how the um, the, the uh, injection zones were, were finally implemented. Um, the dark blue line, again, is what we believed was the extent of residual NAPL in that lower pancake from 25 to 35 feet below ground surface. The blue dots here are our injection points for our injection zones. Uh, we had originally 
uh, plan to do four lines of injection points at 7.7% uh, gypsum in the slurry. But at this site, because we realized we could inject more, we wound up doing three rows with 10.4%. So we got the same mass of gypsum in the ground. We just did it with fewer points. We had calculated that the sulfate after it dissolved from the injection point would should last about 110 feet. The, the um, residual saturation uh, zone was a little bit longer than that. And so we included a few injection points down here near the toe of the um, El Napo source zone uh, to make sure that we would have uh, sulfate all the way down. We couldn't do a complete row here because of all of the buried piping in the area. And this is a building off to the side here. We couldn't inject there. Uh, the other things I want to point out in this picture uh, are monitoring wells that I'll show data from later on. Monitoring well four up here just south of the primary injection zone, five and six down through the, the, the source area, and well three uh, just on the down gradient side of the supplemental injection zone. So this is the site in profile. Um, we're looking from north to south uh, uh, as we go from left to right. So up gradient to down gradient. Again, the ground surface, the dash blue line, the upper um, extent of the water table and the lower extent of the water table. The dark blue line, again, the extent of residual saturation. And so our primary injection zone was in this orange shaded area here, near the up gradient end of the lower pancake and our supplemental uh, injection zone uh, a little bit further down towards the down gradient end. And in our monitoring wells four, five, six, and three. So we, uh, in place of gypsum in the 2017 field season, in total, we injected uh, nearly 200,000 pounds of gypsum into 340 boreholes at four sites. Uh, these guys are about to put the last bag in the hopper. Um, and since the 2017 field season, we have been monitoring groundwater uh, and uh, we monitor groundwater annually for gasoline, diesel, and residual rage organics, VOCs, methane, and sulfate. The next couple of slides are about performance uh, to date, the first three years worth of data. Um, I'll address injection zone longevity, um, sulfate utilization, evidence of enhanced biological activity and impact to groundwater contaminants. But first I wanna talk about injection zone longevity and just as a reminder, we, we designed the injection zones for a five year life. Uh, in the graph here, you see um, time since uh, the injection point, the zero point right here and then sulfate concentration on the y-axis. The red dashed line is the ambient sulfate concentration in Galena groundwater. And you'll see we did increase sulfate concentration, um, but the interesting thing was that those two northernmost wells, wells four and five, uh, we actually found that they were near the ambient concentration of sulfate. So the northern part of what we thought was the residual saturation zone uh, actually was not methanogenic, but, but was probably iron reducing. Wells six and three were significantly sulfate depleted and were methanogenic. Um, and in all cases, we were able to raise the sulfate concentration uh, of the groundwater, but you see that concentrations are decreasing uh, quite rapidly as of year three, 
Um, so we would expect that uh, the sulfate is pretty much going to be depleted by the time we go out and monitor this year, year four. So we've got a little bit shorter lifespan than we had hoped. Um, and as a result of, of some other studies at other sites, uh, I think we, we probably underestimated the groundwater flux at, at this site and that uh, hydraulic conductivity is a little bit higher than, than we had anticipated. This graph is a little complicated, uh, but uh, here we're looking at sulfate and methane concentrations over distance. So the x-axis is uh, distance from the uh, primary injection zone. The two black lines that you see here are the primary and the supplemental injection zones. Um, sulfate concentrations are on a log scale on the um, left-hand uh, y-axis, methane concentrations on the right-hand y-axis. And so this blue line that you see here, solid line, is sulfate concentrations um, just uh, at the time that we uh, were ready to inject sulfate. And you can see sulfate was present in the two most upgradient wells, but was depleted uh, down towards the southern end of the source zone in wells uh, six and three. Um, and methane uh, was present in wells um, six and three, indicating methanogenic conditions. After we injected sulfate, we see sulfate concentrations have uh, increased uh, over the course of all three years. Um, and interestingly enough, methane concentrations have also increased. And so um, we think that uh, based on looking at this is that uh, the sulfate travel at least 125 feet down gradient before it uh, was back to ambient conditions, which is close to the 110 feet that we calculated. Um, and then um, we are, have seen, as I said, increases in methane concentrations. And what we attribute this to is, is pockets of methanogenic uh, conditions uh, in the source area and downgrading of the source area. And uh, as the, the sulfate in, um, causes uh, biodegradation of the fuels, it creates uh, partially oxidated compounds that are more readily degraded by um, methanogenic uh, processes, so we're also seeing the increase in methane, which to us is an indication of biological activity. The next couple of slides are concentrations of contaminants in groundwater. Um, in all cases, we are looking at concentration on a log scale on the y-axis, Time on the x-axis, the red dashed line is the Alaska cleanup standard. And for benzene and naphthalene, we are seeing pretty uh, abrupt uh, decreases in concentrations over the, the first three years of operation uh, and trending towards the cleanup levels. Um, these two uh, graphs are for diesel range organics on the left and gasoline range organics on the right. Gasoline was already pretty close to cleanup levels before, before we began, but, but, but we appear to be there. Um, the two most upgradient wells for diesel actually already met the cleanup criteria. But the thing that we're seeing in the two uh, further downgradient wells in the source area, we're seeing a pattern that we typically see at, at several of these sites, and we're seeing diesel range organics actually increasing. And so what's the reason for that? So um, the Alaska Method 102 that is used for uh, uh, estimating uh, diesel range organic uh, concentrations in soil and groundwater um, does not 
is not specific to, to aliphatic and aromatic hydrocarbons. It also will give you all of the hydrocarbons between C10 and C25. So that includes partially oxygenated, um, partially biodegraded compounds such as acids, alcohols, ketones, esters, phenols, and so on, uh, in with the, the overall DRO number that the method gives back. So what we did was we did a, uh, a low flow sample, um, uh, not, not um, screened in any way, and we also did a, uh, a, a sample, a, a split sample that was run through uh, silica gel to clean out these uh, polar partially oxygenated compounds. So if all of the um, concentration that we were seeing in the DRO analysis was from a pure fuel, um, that is without any oxygenated compounds, just uh, aromatic and aliphatic hydrocarbons, we would expect the uh, method AK102 results with silica gel cleanup on the y-axis to be the same as the low flow sample without silica gel cleanup and to plot along this black line here. But in fact, what we saw was is that the concentrations with silica gel cleanup were considerably lower than the ones that were not cleaned up, which over 95% of the uh, results that are being re uh, reported as AK102 are these partially oxygenated compounds. So we are getting considerable biodegradation, considerable uh, uh, degradation, and uh, the uh, original fuel aromatic and aliphatic components of, of diesel fuel are are very small components on what's left in the groundwater at Galena. In summary, um, we, we did uh, design and install sulfate enhanced bioremediation, which we, we believe is a green remedy to address uh, residual petroleum source areas at four sites at Galena. We believe that we've got data to date that show the systems are generally working as designed, although um, we are depleting the gypsum a little bit faster than we had hoped. Um, we calculate that at site ST09, sulfate is responsible for maybe 7% of the total mass removal. Um, we are doing soil vapor extraction at this site, which is very efficient at removing VOC mass, um, which accounts for you know three quarters of the mass that's been removed at this site. But the sulfate is contributing and particularly contributing down in that lower pancake area where the um, soil is, is very seldom unsaturated and SVE is not effective. Um, our path forward uh, this summer, we are planning on doing soil sampling down in the lower pancake uh, to uh, look at uh, what's left of, of residual saturation and particularly look for signs of weathering. Uh, down in that area, and we are going to evaluate whether or not uh, additional sulfate amendments are needed and where. Um, that's my presentation, and uh, before we open it up to questions, I do want to acknowledge our team. We've been working at Galena for eight years and uh, have had quite a few people supporting the project. Um, the ones listed here are just a few of those, but there are some folks who who contributed uh, directly to the sulfate enhanced degradation remedies at our four sites. So, with that, uh, thank you. All right, thanks a lot, Ed. Um, at this point, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Jessica Bennett to open up for questions. Uh, you can either use the chat feature here in MS Teams and submit a question, or you can also, uh, there's a little option to raise your hand in Teams, and you can raise your hand and she will uh, she'll call on folks who, who would like to ask a question out loud. Thanks, Pat. Uh, okay, the first person I saw was uh, Eric Mysona. Um, please go ahead. 
Yeah, Ed, hey, great to talk. Yeah, thanks for uh, the information. And thanks for using a couple of my folks. Uh, yeah, Rick Heinzman and uh, Tony Dahl have actually worked up there and they really enjoyed that the experience. So thanks for that. Um, so Rick, qu quick question about how did they do the injection? Was it through a direct push uh, geoprobe rig? Yes. And I guess looking at the high groundwater flux here, was there any consideration looking at a um, installing uh, monitoring points to for reinjection or, or or would those potentially clog up well I, th I think you know we we wanted to minimize our infrastructure up there and and we were hoping that uh, if we did have to reinject we'd only have to do it once um, so that uh, you know we we didn't really want to maintain a, a, a permanent injection system I mean the, the whole point of injecting solid gypsum was was to let it dissolve slowly over time i know other applications of sulfate enhanced bioremediation have actually dissolved sulfate in solution and and dripped it into you know the injection zones and given the 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 weather and the you know the lack of support up there we were looking for a, a, a low maintenance approach Okay, thanks. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Melanie Beck. Sorry, hand up. Hi. Um, I had a question. Have similar techniques been implemented at other sites at Galena? Uh, and if so, were they successful? We implemented this technology at four sites. Um, and I think they're all working about the same. The, the one site that I've shown you is the only one I've dug this deeply into the data. Um, and it is a JP4 site. Uh, the other sites are Arctic diesel. So I'm kind of expecting, uh, uh, you know, we, we didn't do the SVE. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if, if, if it's been as successful there as it has been at the JP4 site. Thank you. Uh, we have a question in the chat uh, box from Christine Kymak. Uh, prior to selection of sulfate injections as your remedy, did you look at nutrient concentrations? Uh, how did you determine that they wouldn't be a limiting factor in anaerobic biodegradation? Well, we, we knew that um, we, we knew that uh, there was plenty of, of organic matter up there and uh, you know there is a hierarchy of electron acceptors oxygen to nitrate to iron manganese to sulfate and so on and uh, we knew that uh, based on on the wells that we had there that that sulfate was depleted and and the the areas were methanogenic so we knew biological activity was going on and uh, based on on the depletion of sulfate, we, we felt that uh, adding more sulfate would would uh, be able to enhance you know the processes that were already occurring up there. Thanks, Ed. Um, William Chen, uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi, thank you. Um, and so you you showed the comparison between air sparging and sulfate enhanced power remediation. I'm just wondering if your team considered oxygen enhanced power remediation, uh, given like you said, oxygen being a more efficient acceptor. And also I think with oxygen enhanced, you're also injecting chemicals and in a way it's it's it gets away away from all that uh, machinery complexity of air sparging. So I was wondering if you thought about that and why that wasn't a given consideration for your site. We did not uh, consider it. Um, you know, and again, I think the, you know, the remote location that we were, we would have had to import oxygen um, and or or generated on site. And those were, you know, complicating factors with uh, would have been complicating factors with, you know, the remoteness of this particular site that, that you know, we were we were looking for um, as as uh, as a hands off system as as we could possibly come up with. 
Uh, we have another uh, question in the chat from John Ratz. Uh, hi, Ed. Great presentation. Thank you. Did your study generate any information regarding how much the sulfate biocomponent accelerated cleanup rates um, or decreased the time to achieving cleanup goals over baseline conditions? Uh, with the baseline being SCE for Vedosone uh, coupled with standard MNA for groundwater. We have, um, I don't have those numbers, but some of the wells at Galena have been monitored for a good number of years. So we do know what the ambient um, decay rates were before we began um, remediation. And the concentrations uh, of uh, compounds with the exception of DRO, as I, as I talked about, you know, the benzene, the naphthalene, the GRO, the, the decay, the, the concentrations did uh, decrease abruptly relative to um, the ambient uh, uh, decay, um, decreasing rate. So we know that um, the remedies are accelerating cleanup and you know the the sulfate enhanced bioremediation was was uh, implemented in concert with the the SVE or the bioventing so we can't really say how much um, the sulfate enhanced bioremediation would have done on its own we can estimate the mass removal due to SVE. We can estimate uh, mass removal due to aerobic biodegradation by um, looking at respiration test data. And then uh, that's how I base that 7% of the total mass removal due to sulfate uh, on, because we could, we could estimate the mass removal of the rest of them and then the sulfate we know the sulfate was utilized, so we assume that uh, it, it it all contributed to to mass removal, and uh, so so we got a pretty good handle on how much was sulfate, how much was aerobic biodegradation, how much was was soil vapor extraction, um, but I couldn't tell you what sulfate would be if the SVE and wasn't there. I don't know if that answers John's question. Yeah, that was a really comprehensive answer. Uh, and, and John, if you have any more clarification, just please, uh, please ask in the box. Um, we have a question from John Halstead. Um, the ORP seems relatively high, even though DO is low. What, uh, what ORP is optimum for petroleum degradation and is lower ORP uh, a potential optimization tool? I don't have a good answer for that. Um... Basically, I don't really trust ORP measurements anyway because they they are notoriously very variable and and, and difficult to do. Uh, I I tend to put more faith in um, measurements such as as uh, dissolved oxygen, iron, sulfate, and looking looking at all of the electron acceptors as a whole. And, uh, you know, sometimes with wells, you're looking at, you're combining several different areas together and you've got to make an educated guess. So it's, I don't know that, that, that uh, with field data that it can be an exact science, but, but uh, you know, again, towards the southern part of that l Napple source area, we definitely had methane present, we had sulfate uh, uh, depleted. So we're pretty certain we were in a methanogenic area and uh, and adding sulfate uh, could, could uh, provide more electron acceptors and therefore more biodegradation. Okay, thanks, Ed. Um, we've got another question from Glenn Ulrich. Um, you showed strong reductions in benzene and naphthalene after sulfate addition. Did all hydrocarbons decrease in concentration or did others uh, not decrease? 
No, they all decreased. Um, the reason I showed benzene and naphthalene is because those um, two VOCs have some of the lowest cleanup standards and tend to be the contaminants along with DRO and GRO that are the, the, that'll ultimately drive you know clean up and close out of the site. But but the benzene and and naphthalene results were not atypical of, of of other compounds like toluene and and xylene and so on. Thanks, Ed. Uh, if anyone has else has a question, uh, please feel free to raise your hand, or you can enter a question in the chat box. While they're thinking of questions, uh, Ed, can you can you advance to the uh, the last slide there? Can you see it? So next month um, we will have another presentation in our series. It'll actually be on June 9th. Uh, this one is a combination of a sustainability and innovation. Uh, Ajish Nambiar will be discussing using a Fenton's chemistry application, uh, actually using native iron for the destruction of 1,4-dioxane in a groundwater system. So you won't want to miss that. It's a, it's a pretty interesting topic there as well. Uh, that'll be June 9th, uh, same time, and we will be getting those announcements out uh, here within the next week or so, so that you can get it on your calendar. Uh, one last call for questions. And Janet, I will get the, a sign-in sheet to you. All right, with that, Ed, I thank you very much for the presentation, time and effort, and uh, we will uh, close at this point and talk to everybody again on June 9th. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.